Well, to start with, I'm really impressed. Uh, one of the uh, capabilities, capacities uh, that I try to impress on members and students at the Victoria Zen Center is that uh, this practice is not one of sort of the rigid sort of following. You know, we don't turn off our brain and just sort of follow along in Zen practice. Sometimes things happen in practice and what is required is this immediate presence to be able to improvise, to be able to meet the situation as it arises. And so just in this past Kinhin, there was this little miss, something happened. And it was wonderful to see that the people who are responsible for the leadership of their individual roles just kind of rolled with it to make it work. I'm really, that's amazing, impressive. Uh, I wanted to also just talk about Kinhin a little bit, um, just watching people doing the walking meditation. So if you, if you would just want to look at me for a second. Uh, so when we're sitting, we're given this instruction that two finger widths below our navel is the hara or the dantian in Chinese, the center of gravity. And when we sit, the right hand goes on the bottom, the left hand over top. This is an energetic, the right hand being the sort of uh, a symbol, I guess, or the physical manifestation of the active side, the yang side, uh, arising side, and the left being the passive, receptive, uh, dissolving minus side. So this is the birth side. This is the death side. So when we sit, we actually allow this sort of receptive, dissolving side to cover as we form this circle. The center of the circle being the, the hara. When we move to walking meditation, we don't just flip up. First of all, the place where we put our hands is not the same place. We don't hold our hands on the same place when we do our walking meditation. The solar plexus, which is if you find your sternum, there's just a, 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 a section, it's like a triangle of muscle just below the, uh, the sternum, the solar plexus. You put your right hand flat on that with your left hand covering. Again, taking this active hand and allowing the receptive hand to sort of cover. And we don't just sort of like, you know, walk uh, with the hands sort of resting on our bellies. There's an energy of kind of like a, like a scissor cut in, in the hands so that there's a real liveliness in the, in the walk. The posture is very upright. The forearms are parallel to the floor, as the Jikijitsu says. And there's a sort of brightness in the walking. There's an energetic in the, in the sort of presence of walking. You're connected with the people in front of you. You're connected with the people behind you. The temptation is to really sort of like stare at the person's feet in front of you. But again, just like when you're sitting, you want to sort of open up your vision to include sort of the whole room that you're walking in. You're paying attention to the person in front of you, keeping in step with them, but don't let your focus become so narrow that you're just sort of like uh, bumping into them. Otherwise, when uh, small mistakes are made in the walking meditation, you have no way of responding to it, reacting to it. So that's all the sort of form instruction. <coughs> Last week, uh, I was away in San Diego. I uh, attended the Generation X uh, Dharma Teachers Meeting at um, Deer Park Monastery, which is in Escondido, California. It's a, it's a big monastery in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh, and there were 60 teachers of all different uh, Buddhist traditions there, all born between 1960 and 1980, Generation X. Uh, so I, I kind of uh, half-jokingly said, you know, it was the future of Buddhism in the West. And in a lot of ways, it's very true. These are all sort of up-and-coming uh, teachers that have communities of their own. And it was a wonderful experience for me to um, step off of my little island here and into a bigger pool uh, for me personally, the past several years have been a period of uh, almost exile, isolation in some ways. Uh, 
Our community here has spent a lot of time on introspection, really looking at how we want to carry our community and our practice, this tradition of Rinzai Zen forward. And in a lot of ways, we've, done, we've made a lot of choices and decisions based on our own experience and our own wisdom. And so it was wonderful for me to step off the island, to step out of our community and to go and uh, rub shoulders with uh, these 60 different teachers from, from all over the place. Uh, <laughs> they're all kind of wonderful people. It was a wonderful sharing, great time to sort of explore what each other are doing uh, that's different from one another, and a, a good place to explore what many of us are doing uh, that are similar, the challenges that we face. The challenges of, of bringing this, uh, for each of us, what is a deeply uh, and powerfully transformative practice, but in virtually every case, one that comes from a, a patriarchal a hierarchical uh, culture and tradition. How do we bring that forward into the modern West? How do we include women? How do we include people of color? How do we include uh, different sexual orientations? It was a, absolutely... I could have stayed up all night, although I was really tired by the end of it because often uh, I feel like I don't have anyone to talk to about this stuff. And here I was with 60 people, so it was not the most quiet of Buddhist retreats, I have to say. One of the things that deeply struck me, uh, both in being there as well as in coming back here, coming back to my home, to our Sangha, is how uh, intimate, trusting, safe, effective, I guess, uh, for lack of a, I don't know, that's a good word, our community has become through our efforts here. It's a wonderful thing, and uh, it's a beautiful thing for me to look around at our community, our practice, our direction, and recognize that what we have going on here is what many of these teachers aspire to. I went down there thinking, you know, I was alone that our community was kind of isolated here on this rock. But we put a lot of stuff out there. I'm not the most uh, private Zen monk. And the number of people that came up to me and spoke to me about how much they appreciated what we do here, what we make available to people who don't have practice places in their area. You see this camera sitting in the middle of the room, and I've got this microphone on. A lot of what we do in our community is recorded and made available for free online to all those people in little towns all over the world that don't have a Dharma center, that don't have a place to practice in. Oh, this reminds me. Uh, one of the things that was suggested to me was that I speak to those people in one of these talks and say, you know, I think we've put up about 300 talks at this point. So I've talked about all kinds of my personal background and history and lots of Dharma talks. And when people contact me, sometimes I get the impression that they really know me. And maybe they do. Every month I just did our monthly, my monthly Abbott's report to our board where I... I, I talk about all the statistics and things that are going on. And every month there's about between 10,000 and 20,000 downloads of podcast talks. And I wonder who's downloading them. 
So maybe I just ask that anybody who's listening to this, and anybody in this room is included, watching it on YouTube, uh, maybe just take a moment to email me and let me know a little bit about yourself. One uh, idea that came out of this meeting was this concept of wayfinding stories. Each of us is here practicing. Each of us has found our way to practice for some reason, through some story. Many of us through some suffering. And those stories are valuable, deeply personal. And they're a great joy to share. So if you care to, uh, please let me know. Eshu at zenwest.ca. I'd love to hear from you. Fundamentally, this practice is an opportunity for us to wake up. In Buddhism, there is this teaching of the three treasures, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. It's helpful for us to make relationship with somebody who has experience in this practice, somebody who is awake to some degree. This is one way of understanding Buddha. If you're interested in a practice, whether it's learning to play guitar or learning to meditate, it's of tremendous value to make contact, to make relationship with somebody who has this experience, this knowledge. Dharma means law. It's important to find a connection with a particular teaching, style, form that speaks to you. Maybe this is one. But there are 15 Buddhist centers in Victoria alone. And there are many more centers of all different kinds of traditions and churches of all kinds of different traditions and different spiritualities of all different kinds of traditions. It's important to find one that you connect with. This is Dharma. Sangha means community of practitioners. This is one that a lot of people sort of put off as being sort of the least important or the one we can take care of last. But what comes more and more clear to me the longer that I practice is that practicing within the context of a community is of utmost importance. The practice of dharma, the manifestation of the wisdom of any tradition, can be seen, can be experienced in relationship in the community. You simply don't get a profound wisdom teaching and a dysfunctional, crappy community. You can't have a brilliant, wise, skillful teacher and a dysfunctional, crappy community. One of the things that you can look for as a seeker, as a person of the way, is a community that speaks to you, that embraces you, that supports you. A community that can offer you refuge when you're struggling that can offer you support when you're stumbling, that can offer you a place to contribute when you're feeling balanced, when you're feeling full, when you feel like you've got something to offer. And one of the things that most strongly resounds for me after this trip away is how... Even after all of these years of practice, I can think so little of what I've done, so little of the practice that I've done, the community that I've contributed to, the efforts that I've made. And what a joy it is for me to come back from this kind of a trip, this kind of experience, and to look around at what we've created here together. and to be happy 
to be fulfilled. To look at Zen West and say this is good. So for those of you who have been coming for a long time, I'm deeply grateful for your efforts and contributions to making this practice available, to making this community what it is. And to those people who are new for their first time or just getting to know practice, I encourage you to investigate, critically investigate. Look with both eyes open. Ask questions. Explore practices. Go and visit other centers and see what they're all about. And know that you're welcome here. Know that the door is open. And know that... uh, you are welcome to become a part of this community. We'd be happy to have you. Thanks.